A week away from spring practices, who has the most to prove on this Texas football team? You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. On today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, a two-part episode, we're discussing every position group on this Texas football team, which player in each position group has the most to prove during spring practices, we we'll start next Monday, March 6th, for the Longhorns offense. Today, defense tomorrow. You do not want to miss either episode. So subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, subscribe, download on audio, whatever you need to do. I'm giving you two chances to argue with me. Each position group on the Texas football team, offense today, defense tomorrow. Which player in each group has the most to prove in spring practice? On Saturday, this Texas basketball team lost on the road to the Baylor Bears in Waco, a tough matchup in two top 10 teams. They end the regular season on Saturday in the Moody Center against Kansas. They play on Wednesday night against TCU on the road. So we give you a basketball update. Plus, this Texas baseball team did not get the sweep against the Indiana Hoosiers, but did win the series going two and one between Friday and Sunday. So we talk about all of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So baseball might be my favorite sport. And I've always said that baseball has the shortest off season, right? Maybe it's because they have the longest on season when you play for six to seven months, obviously there's not going to be a lot of time between finishing playing baseball and starting up again. But it always seems like as soon as the season ends, it starts right back up. And I hate what they're doing to the game. I love with this pitch clock and all of that, but that's a conversation for another day, maybe another podcast. Right. But the baseball off season is always short, right? That's great for baseball fans. Football, not so much. This Texas football team has not played since December and won't play again until September. So I am anxiously waiting for this Texas football team to come back, as you are, I would hope, if you're listening to this podcast. On a personal note, I am not in a rush to get to September. This is the last year of my 20s. I turned 30 on September 16th. Please mark your calendars. So I'm not in a rush to end my 20s, but definitely in a rush to see some Texas football. And I'm excited about spring practice, as I would hope you are as well still listening to this podcast. I've said that championship level teams are built in the off season, right? Whether it's a conference championship level team, whether it's a national championship level team, even if you don't win it, the foundation for a team that's able to compete for it is built in the off season and winter workouts and strength and conditioning is very vital to what type of team you'll be during the season. But the first chance that you really get to see who you are on the field happens in spring practices. And we're a week away from that for the Texas Longhorns. I'm very excited. And so we're going to discuss each position group on the Texas football team ahead of spring practices. Who has the most to prove? I'm giving you one player in each position group, two different chances to argue with me. Offense on today's episode, defense on tomorrow's episode. I promise you do not want to miss either one. Let's start with the quarterback room. I think the obvious answer would be Quinn Ewers. Quinn Ewers does have a lot to prove this season. Right. Coming out of high school as one of the highest rated uh, quarterback recruits ever. He foregoes his senior season at South Lake Carroll, takes a milli in NIL money to go to Ohio State. Allegedly doesn't work out at Ohio State, comes to the University of Texas and has an underwhelming season. B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson, who carried literally the offense last year, both go to the NFL. Now you go from a 12 personnel power run team to more of a spread 11 personnel team where the success of this Texas offense, really the success of this Texas football team largely falls on the shoulders, quite literally, of Quinn Ewers. He has a lot to prove this season, but he does not have a lot to prove in spring practices. To me, if you have a lot to prove, that means you either have a lot to gain or a lot to lose. Quinn Ewers has nothing to gain in spring practices because he's already quarterback one. And to me, he doesn't have a lot to lose because no matter what happens in spring practices, Quinn Ewers will still be quarterback one. Maybe not the answer you wanted, but that's just reality. So it can't be Quinn Ewers. People are going to say, oh, it's Arch Manning. Once again, one of the highest graded quarterback recruits ever, maybe the most hyped college football recruit ever. And people are going to hang on to everything Arch Manning does. We already know how many student IDs he's had in his first semester of college. And he's a true freshman, right? 
So the reports are going to be mixed. There's going to be great reports where people are going to drink Kool-Aid and there's going to be bad reports that are going to find their ways into the hands of Texas A&M and Oklahoma fans. And they're going to say, see, I told you so. Right. But he's a true freshman. Spring practice is going to be his second full month on campus. And we know this is going to be a developmental year for Arch Manning. That's what his family wants. That's what he wants. And I'm sure that's what this Texas staff wants as well. Right. If Arch Manning has to go out there and play football this year, something went wrong. Right. So. He doesn't have a lot to gain or lose during spring practice. So it can't be Arch Manning. To me, it's Malik Murphy. And a lot of people felt like Malik Murphy had a chance to be quarterback too going into the season last year, although Hudson Card ended up being really good and being the quarterback we needed when Quinn Ewers went down. And because of injuries in high school and then another injury riding a scooter downtown in Austin, he did not get the chance to throw a football last year at all on the field, right? He wasn't quarterback two until the Alamo Bowl and then did not play in that game. To me, in comparison to Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, he has the most to gain or the most to lose in spring practices. Because, like I said, there's going to be this media and hype machine on the quarterback directly behind him in Quinn Ewers. I mean, in Arch Manning. If you can hold him off during spring practices, that means that he had a strong showing, right? Because I think if Arch Manning outplays Malik Murphy in spring practices, there'll no, there'll be no hesitation making him quarterback too. Malik Murphy has to hold off Arch Manning to keep this quarterback two job. Not sure how much of an opportunity he'll get this year, right? That depends on when you were staying healthy. Not sure how much of an opportunity he'll get moving forward, right? That's just the reality when you have a very talented quarterback room, only one can play at a time. But, for Malik Murphy's future, it's imperative that he wins this quarterback two job and is in line to play or start if anything happens to Quinn Ewers. For Malik Murphy, it's imperative that he has a strong spring showing and at least has the ability to play at the end of the Rice in the Wyoming game, hopefully, right? That's going to bode well for Malik Murphy. And then, like I said, just narrative-wise, holding off Arch Manning will look really good for him as well. I'm not sure what is in store for the future for Malik Murphy, but this year he needs to be quarterback too. And this year he has an opportunity to put some good stuff on film, regardless of what happens in the future. But that's going to start with a strong spring showing. Going into the running back room, to me, Jonathan Brooks has a role going into the season. We've seen him on the field. He's been dynamic when given the ball. Cedric Baxter, because of the injuries to Jaden Blue and Jonathan Brooks, has already kind of taken on a running back role, running back one role, albeit in winter conditioning and winter workouts but he was the number one running back in the country, right? You don't bring in that type of player, especially at a position like running back, to sit on the bench. He has a defined role. Keelan Robinson has now been with Sark with three, for three years, right, at the University of Alabama and then two years at the University of Texas. And I think he'll go back to his utility role, how he was used behind Roshan and Bijan during the season, not how he was used as a between-the-tackles running back in the Alamo Bowl, Sark, right? And so I think he has a role on this football team. And then what he does on special teams can't be understated. So he has a definitive role on this football team. It's hard to use more than three running backs consistently. So where does that leave Jaden Blue and Trey Wisner? But Trey Wisner is a true freshman. So you can easily just chalk that up to, you know, youth, right? You have a lot of more experienced players ahead of you. Jaden Blue is a very talented running back. Once was the number one running back in the country before he opted out of his senior season. And to me, has the most home run ability out of any running back on this team. He has the most, you put the ball in his hands and he can make special things happen, even more than Cedric Baxter and Jonathan Brooks from a home run hitting perspective. So we talk about what do you have to gain and what do you have to lose? Well, if he has a strong spring showing, this Texas staff can't keep him off the field. They're going to have to find a way to use four running backs or they're going to have to, you know, give maybe Jonathan Brooks, Cedric Baxter or Keelan Robinson less touches than they intended because they're going to have to say we can't keep a running back like Jaden Blue off the field. If he doesn't have a strong spring showing, he's making the decision for them. Jonathan Brooks, Cedric Baxter and Keelan Robinson will be our running back rotation this year. So I think his spring, his performance will either. He'll either be a player coming out of the spring that this Texas staff says we have to find a way to get him on the field. He's one of our most explosive and best offensive players. Or they can say he didn't have a strong spring and we have three very capable running backs ahead of him going into the season. At the tight end position, I started to say Gunnar Helm, right? Whoever's going to compete for that tight end two position. We know that JT Sanders is one of the five best tight ends in the country. So he can't have a lot to prove, especially in spring practices. 
on the field. But I still went with JT Sanders. And the reason is, is because I talked about it on here, but last week there was a story that came out that JT Sanders is trying to become the vocal leader, one of the vocal leaders on this Texas football team. A void that has been left by B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson, right? And when you look at the players on this offense, especially the top players, who would be the leading candidate to be the vocal leader? Nobody necessarily stands out. As I said, Quinn Ewers, even if he's really good, he's more of a lead by example. Uh, Kelvin Banks seems more of a lead by example than a rah-rah guy, right? JT Sanders is taking on that role of being the rah-rah vocal leader while also trying to lead by example. If he comes in and has a strong spring, right? Because this is the time last year that we heard, you know, Bijan and Rosan were really stepping up in that role, being the vocal leaders of the team right around spring practices. JT Sanders is taking on that role. If he has a strong spring as a leader, right? I know this is a little of a wild card, on the field and doing everything from a, you know, look at me perspective, leading by example, but also as a vocal leader, I think that bodes well for everybody on this Texas football team going into the season. But if he comes into the spring, doesn't have a great spring, he's not really leading by example, not being the vocal leader or not doing it the right way, I think it can have a negative impact on this football team. And, you know, we all know in different areas of life, whether it's sports, the workplace, wherever, when you try to be a leader and fail, it's hard to bounce back from that. So I think JT Sanders has a lot to prove from a leadership perspective. If that's the role that he wants to take on, he has to take it on successfully. That's why I think he has a lot to prove in spring practice. And there's just really no tight end, I think, that can touch JT Sanders in terms of on the field. And I think Gunnar Helm is pretty safely locked into that tight end two spot. That's why I went with the leadership angle for JT Sanders in the tight end room. Number four, wide receiver. I'm going to go Jonte Cook. And I thought about Xavier Worthy. He has a lot to prove, but once again, not in spring practice. going to be during the season. A.D. Mitchell is too accomplished to have a lot to prove in uh, spring practices. Same with Jordan Whittington. Isaiah Nayor is not 100% healthy, so he won't be participating in spring practices. Jonte Cook, to me, has the chance or has the biggest variance going into spring practice. Because we saw last year in the wide receiver room, maybe it'll be different this year, but talent wasn't enough to get you on the field, right? Talent didn't get Savion Red on the field, and talent didn't get Brendan Thompson on the field. And now you're going to have Jonte Cook, DeAndre Moore, and Ryan Niblett as presumably your fifth, sixth, and seventh receivers, right? But we know Jonte Cook is probably too talented to keep off the field. But I think if he has a very, very strong spring practice, there's a chance he could enter that top four, even over Jordan Whittington, just off of natural ability, right? If he doesn't, then we can see maybe a scenario where I think he's going to have a better year than Savion Red and Brennan Thompson have regardless. But I think with a strong spring in offseason, he could be a 35 to 50 catch receiver this season. I think with a not strong spring, maybe he doesn't grasp the offense. Maybe he doesn't shine as quickly as we thought he would. He could be a 10 to 20 catch receiver this season. So I think his on-field role this year really is going to start being impacted by what he does in the spring. Like I said, a strong spring. I could see him getting 35 to 50 catches this year, really being your wide receiver for maybe not in terms of personalities or on the depth chart, but when you look at who caught what at the end of the season, he'll be up there. And if he doesn't, like I said, I think he could kind of be on that true freshman learning curve where he only has, you know, maybe around 20 to 25 catches. And we have to wait till next year to really see him have a big impact. But I think with a strong spring, a strong off season, we'll see a heavy dose of Jonte Cook this year. And then on the offensive line, to me, it's the two guard positions. It's Hayden Connor and Cole Hudson. I talked about last year, this was around the time where Cole Hudson really asserted himself as being the starting guard. By the time that spring practices ended, we knew that Cole Hudson was probably going to be the starting guard going into the season. A lot of young players have that same opportunity, right? Who can be the Cole Hudson for this year? And there's some players like that on the offensive line, right? Jaden Chapman and uh, Peyton Kirkland. Can they come in and compete for these guard spots? We've talked at nauseum about how last year the interior of the offensive line just was not great, right? And a lot of that was Cole Hudson and Hayden Connor. And I think the biggest competition for those spots right now is DJ Campbell. And the reports are saying that he's going to miss the spring. So that's a huge benefit to Hayden Connor and Cole Hudson to keep their jobs, right? Because you're getting so much of the first team rip. So I think it's a huge spring for them because they have a lot to prove to Kyle Flood and Steve Sarkeesian that they can be a lot better this year, especially when you're not going to have B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson to cover up holes, right? 
like the holes that they were getting through and making plays out of breaking tackles and making plays. A lot of the time it was in spite of what the offensive line was doing. You were going to need the offensive line to be a lot better, especially on the interior. And so Hayden Connor and Cole Hudson have a lot to prove, not only this season, but during the spring, because like I said, there's a lot of young and very talented players that Kyle Flood has brought in. They're going to be very hungry to get on the field. Right. And if Hayden Connor and Cole Hudson don't come out, come out and dominate in the spring, then Kyle Flood is going to have some very interesting decisions to make. That was the offense, the players with the most approved in each position group. Malik Murphy at quarterback, Jaden Blue at running back, JT Sanders at tight end from a leadership perspective, Jonte Cook at wide receiver, Hayden Connor and Cole Hudson on that interior offensive line. Stay tuned for tomorrow's episode where we go through for the defense and a quick word from our sponsors in Built Bar. And then we talk about the Texas basketball and baseball teams, what they did over the weekend. Looking for a delicious treat, but don't want all of the fat and the calories, then you have to try a Built Bar. We just got through the holidays and I know my goal is to eat a little bit healthier this year. If you're like me where you want to eat healthier, healthier but don't want to compromise taste and man i've got just the thing for you you have to try built bar with built healthy is actually tasty seriously they're so delicious you won't think they're good for you perfect for your new year's resolution what makes built bar so good you ask well for answers <laughs> they are covered in 100 percent real chocolate that's right real chocolate and they come in amazing flavors like churro peanut butter brownie and coconut almond i'm not sure how built does it but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros and what's even better is that they are healthy only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein and now you don't need to wait around to get a box for years we've been talking about ordering your built bars at built.com but now you can get them at your local walmart or sam's club that's right head to your nearest walmart today walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of built bars you can pick up a four bar box of cookies and cream double chocolate coconut puffs or whatever flavor floats your boat head to the website head to walmart head to sam's club head to my crib and <laughs> get your built bars today so i said prior to this three game stretch where they played against oklahoma against iowa state and against baylor if they went two in one of these games i would be fine right especially if they played baylor close i can't be mad that you lose to a top 10 team in the country one of the most talented teams in the country a legit national championship contender on the road in a close game, right? In the Big 12, which we know by far is the toughest conference in college basketball. I can't be mad. But then when I add the context, I got pissed, right? Because when you looked at what happened in this game, Texas goes up 18 to four to start the game. While they're up 18 to four, Baylor's leading scorer, I don't know if you can say he's their best player, but leading scorer, Keontae George, leaves the game. Rose's ankle does not come back. Texas is up 18 to four. So you're up by 14 early in the game and their leading score leaves the game and does not return. So I'm like, okay, well, Texas plus three and a half is looking like free money at this point, right? Wrong. After Keontae George limped out of the, <laughs> limped out of the bear pit, as Dick Vitale kept saying, Texas was outscored 77 to 54 by the Baylor Bears. So I went into the game saying I can't be mad if Texas loses this game very quickly into the game. I got pissed, right? Because Texas should be able to beat the Baylor Bears without Keontae George. And Texas should be able, with the talent and experience they have, to hold on to a 14-point lead, even as early as it was. So I was very disappointed in the Texas basketball team for not taking advantage of an opportunity and giving them a chance to play Kansas for the Big 12 regular season title outright. Now it seems like your best case scenario is to tie with Kansas because you didn't take care of business against Baylor, right? I thought that was a game they definitely let slip. And once Keontae George went out, I think that they took their foot off the gas while conversely, Baylor turned it up, right? I think that, you know, Texas saw a wounded basketball team and didn't pounce on them. And that wounded team with their backs against the wall came back and punched Texas in the mouth. Texas never responded. When you talk about... The paint battle. I said that Texas has to win the three guard matchup, uh, you know, between Serge Jabari Rice, Tyrese Hunter and Marcus Carr against Keontae George, Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer. That was more so a wash, especially when Keontae George went out. But the players that stepped in for Keontae George really did better than anything Texas had. I said that Texas has to win the paint battle, right, against Jonathan Tanya Tachua and Flo Thon, but the Texas basketball team, which really has been a theme for most of the season, was out-rebounded. But in this game, they were out-rebounded by double digits. You cannot 
get out rebounded by double digits against a top 10 team in the country on the road and think that you're going to win this basketball game. And that's exactly why they didn't. And I was very disappointed in that as well, because Dylan DeSue gave us 24 points, but have four rebounds. So it's like, yeah, you're doing your job, but you're not doing your job. Flo Thamba coming into the game. A lot of Baylor fans I follow wanted him out of the rotation, period. You give him a double-double in 12-12, right? 12 points, 12 rebounds. So to me, that was just about effort, right? They wanted it more, and they went and got it. And this Texas basketball team let a team out effort them. They forced 21 tur turnovers against the Baylor Bears, which is really good, but you committed 15, right? So although you forced 21 turnovers, you committed 15 yourself, giving them a lot of opportunities for easy baskets. I'm not sure how many easy baskets we got off of the 21 turnovers from the Baylor Bears. Four out of the nine players that played for Texas did not score, right? We're usually a balanced offense that can attack you with everybody on the floor. That did not happen on Saturday where, like I said, five players did all of the scoring for this Texas basketball team. Not great. This is now something that has happened in two straight games, and I'm afraid it is becoming a trend for this Texas basketball team. I told you against Iowa State, 50% of their shot attempts came from the three-point line. That's not who this Texas basketball team is. I think they're a team that can make open threes if you leave Tyrese Hunter, Serge Barry Rice, uh, Dylan DeSue, I guess, and we saw, and, and Marcus Carr open at times. But I don't think this is a team that should rely on the three-point line, should be three-point line or bust. That has been them the last two games. It worked against Iowa State in the first half. and the second half, that game was 25-25 because they started missing those threes. It did not work out in this game as well. So they were 27 out of 60 in terms of three-point shot attempts compared to total shot attempts. So a little less than 50%, but essentially 50%. Way higher than their normal average, right? And yeah, 27 three-point attempts out of 60 total shot attempts. And Baylor beat you in all of the shooting splints, shot higher from the field goal, shot higher from the three-point, and shot higher from the free throw line. So you shooting that many three-point attempts worked against you. It didn't work in your favor, right? It's a boom or bust scenario, right? You either make a bunch of threes and you blow a team out of the gym or you miss a bunch of threes and you halt your offense, right? You live and, buy, you live and die by the three-point line. That's what this Texas basketball team has decided to do the last two games and really the last three halves of basketball, it hasn't worked out for them. They have to get back to getting to the cup, get into the paint and putting pressure on the defense to open up things on the outside. And I know that, you know, Marcus Carr had a lot of open threes. He just missed them. But when you're missing that many threes, I mean, Marcus Carr, Serge Ibari Rice and Tyrese Hunter missed more threes than the Baylor team took period. At some point you got to put your head down and get to the rim. Right. So, you know, all in all, for all of that to happen and them only lose by nine, although that was kind of some, you know, finessing the clock at the end, uh, I think it's still a really good sign. I think they should beat TCU, and we'll see what happens against Kansas on Saturday. Nonetheless, you know, they should have a strong showing in the Big 12 tournament and at the worst will be a top three seed in the NCAA tournament. So I thought it was a game that let slip, but it's also a game that doesn't define your season. And then really quickly, talking about this Texas baseball team, what they were able to accomplish over the weekend, they won last Tuesday against Texas A&M uh, Corpus Christi after starting off the season 0-3. They started off 2-0 against the Indiana Hoosiers on Friday and Saturday. Looked like they possibly could get the sweep, but lost yesterday 4-2 lost yesterday to the to Indiana Hoosiers. But uh, when you look at it on Friday, Porter Brown, they were down, what was it, 2-1, to one, I think. And he had the big three-run homer, the go-ahead three-run homer on Friday to give them the win. When you looked on Saturday, pitching hasn't been great this year, but Zane Morehouse gave you five innings of one run ball and picked up a win. And then yesterday, like I said, you didn't get the win, but Porter Brown had another home run. Gilliam met the catcher. He made a really crazy defensive play where he kind of picks up the ball and, and kind of sidearm throws it while falling to the ground to first uh, to get it out. And then Travis Jill gave you five good innings before he ran into trouble and ultimately was the reason you lost. But seeing some improvement from this Texas baseball team, especially against a good team like Indiana, and hopefully, you know, they can keep it moving forward and continue uh, to pick up wins. It's a long season. And if this Texas baseball team can gel, they still have a chance to do everything that we outlined for them heading into this season. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them and peace. Remember, part two of the players in each position group on the defensive side that has the most approved in spring practice coming right at you. Hook them.